I'm Cindy Bell, the Executive Vice President of Genome Canada, and uh, we've been a long-time sponsor of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health and a sponsor of this current meeting, and we've been very proud to um, be part of this family. And I have the honor today to uh, introduce the keynote speaker, Julia Stor Storjanich who um, is not part of the family and is someone who is bringing to us a, a different perspective. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit first about her background because um, she actually, when she came to the United States, uh, came to Massachusetts. And she actually graduated from high school from Belmont, I believe, Massachusetts. So, so she's a local. She's, she's come back home for a, a visit. Um, but currently, she's the Assistant Professor of Computer Science and Engineering and of Data Science at New York University. Her research focuses on responsible data science. She serves on the New York City Automated Decision Ta Systems Task Force uh, by appointment from uh, the mayor. She's developed and is teaching courses on responsible data science at NYU. And so she holds an MSc and a PhD uh, degrees in computer science from Columbia. And she has a BSc that she also got while she was in Massachusetts. Uh, and it's in computer science and mathematics and statistics from University of Massachusetts at, at Amherst. Uh, she is a recipient of an NSF Career Award. She's got a very interesting title for her talk, which we thought was great right after lunch, um, TransFAT, Translating Fairness, Accountability, and Trans... I see what you're reading there, yes, <laughs> David. Um, translating Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency into Data Science Practice. And what she's going to talk about today are some examples from the public sector. And she's going to give us some instances where um, things can go wrong and, and how we might mitigate those um, wrong paths that have been taken. And she will uh, pose a question, and that is, what does it mean to do data science responsibly? And so I welcome Julia. We're really excited and, and glad that you could find time to come and talk to us today. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. It's uh, a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm humbled, frankly, to be speaking to uh, this distinguished room. Um, and of course, I'm not going to have time to tell you everything that I want to tell you. So I'm here the rest of the day today as well as tomorrow. And my main goal here is really to find synergies between the kind of work that I've been doing and the needs and insights that this community can bring. Um, so trans fat is good for you in, in my in my example, right? You have to open with a joke. So uh, the compulsory first slide uh, is about how wonderful data science is. We wouldn't be sitting in this room today probably if it weren't for all of the advances that large-scale data collection and data analysis has brought. Uh, and these advances give us opportunities to improve things in many, many sectors, including, of course, the health sciences, but also e-commerce, uh, also business, also government. So one of the issues that's particularly of interest to me is how we can use data science to make governments better, more transparent, more accountable, uh, delivering services that are more equitable to the public. Um, so, of course, despite the opening good news, we have to dive right into the bad news. Uh, so for the next few minutes, we will be talk talking about examples of where data science tools and techniques were used just because they were available, essentially. So in a kind of a Wild West style of data science that is still prevalent, unfortunately, in many areas, many domains today. Uh, but we started to see that things can go wrong, and we started to question uh, whether there are in fact cases where we shouldn't be using data science at all, or maybe we should be using it more carefully, more responsibly. So the first example that I became aware of uh, was in 2012 when it was surfaced by computational journalists Ashkan Soltani and others at the Wall Street Journal that Staples Online was giving discounts on its products to people who live in rich neighborhoods 
and it wasn't giving discounts to people who live in poor neighborhoods. How absurd is that? Why would that be the case? So when questioned, Staples said it's Office Depot's fault, actually. Uh, and why is that? It's because it turns out that their strategy for showing uh, coupons, essentially, to people who log on was based on whether or not they lived in an area that had a physical, a brick and mortar store of their competitor there. And because Office Depot doesn't tend to build stores in poor neighborhoods, then none of the discounts were given to people who reside in those neighborhoods. Uh, so, you know, is this a big deal? Just a discount for a stapler? It may or may not be, but unfortunately, in this country, as well as in many other places in the world, uh, socioeconomics correlates with race, ethnicity and race. And so this can be seen as price discrimination based on race, which is illegal. So Staples got in trouble because of this. Now, were the issues solved since 2012 when this was surfaced? No, not really, unfortunately. Uh, so this is a much more recent case uh, where it was surfaced that Amazon uh, does not offer same-day delivery service in certain parts of six major U.S. cities. So here I'm showing you a map of New York City where the Bronx is in gray, and this is where same-day delivery is not available by Amazon. And another city here that I'm showing, of course, is Boston, where Roxbury is grayed out. It's right in the middle of the city, and yet same-day delivery is not available in Roxbury. What is the commonality here? What is the pattern that we're seeing? Both of these are poor neighborhoods, and they are primarily black in both cities. So, you know, is this an issue, same-day delivery? It does repeat a pattern that we've been seeing since the 1930s, if not before. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is a map of Philadelphia, and this is a map that was used by uh, bank loan officers to determine whether or not somebody should get access to financial products, to loans. Areas that are in red are zip codes to which loans should not be given by that particular bank. And these were zip codes where predominantly poor and predominantly black uh, communities lived. And so this bank officer could use an excuse of saying that, oh, I'm not using your race to make a decision about whether or not you're credit worthy. Instead, I'm using the, the zip code. But the effect was one and the same. And this is a kind of an effect that in the banking industry was outlawed in the US. And yet it's showing up again uh, as this digital redlining in these digital environments. Um, here's another example in a different domain. This is the domain of employment. Uh, and in employment, we really are starting to question these issues very, very closely today. Um, so what this example shows from 2014 is that in fact, online personality tests for jobs correlate uh, and they shut out people suffering from mental illness from opportunities. Uh, so this, again, is something that, that should not be legal and is not legal in, in the employment context in the US today. And yet, on an, in an online environment, it's happening uh, silently, scalably, and opaquely. Another example, and this one you may have seen, it, it, made, uh, it, it got quite a lot of publicity, is the study that was done by researchers at Carnegie Mellon uh, who looked at how ads for jobs were uh, delivered to populations based on gender. This was one of the things that they looked at in the study, and this was perhaps the most interesting and most disturbing result. So they created two sets of profiles of web users that were identical in every respect. They're not actual users, they're synthetic. In terms of their stated demographics, their browsing histories, the uh, web search keywords that they used. The only difference between the two groups was their stated gender, male or female. Uh, and users in these profiles simulated an interest in jobs. They went to job search sites, to resume posting sites. Uh, and then the researchers observed what ads members of these groups were served by sites of content providers. Newspapers, for example, the New York Times. And what they saw was that female, in quotes, profiles were shown ads for high paying jobs significantly more frequently than were the male profiles. And the numbers here are striking. 1,852 times uh, a particular ad for high paying jobs was shown to the male group compared to only 318 times to the female group. And this, this already is a problem, right? I mean, this is clearly something that impacts our lives, that impacts opportunities. and. As a matter of fact, in uh, printed advertising for jobs, 
gendered classified columns have been outlawed. We cannot advertise a job in a newspaper to men or to women. And, and yet, in a digital environment, this is showing up. And it's not really clear why this phenomenon is happening and who is in a position to mitigate. So it's a very, very complex phenomenon here, really. Could it be the employer that's advertising in a particular discriminatory way? Could it be the platform that's serving the ads? Could it be the users clicking? And in fact, it's likely all of these components. Um, and the last example that I will show today uh, is uh, about racial bias in criminal sentencing. Have you seen this, this study? So if you have not, I encourage you strongly to read it. I know you're not my students, but this is your homework for today. <laughs> uh, so this was a study published in May 2016, again by computational journalists from ProPublica, that interrogated the use of a tool called Compass in the criminal justice system in the US. So this tool is produced by a commercial company, NordPoint. Its code is black box. We don't know how it works. We have only partial information about how it was validated. The tool is used by judges to, make, uh, to assist them in making sentencing recommendations and bail decisions. Uh, this tool takes as input a bunch of answers from individuals. Uh, it's a pretty extensive questionnaire where they're asked about their demographics, their family history. They're asked to make statements about things like, do you think it's justified for somebody to steal if, if you're hungry, if they're hungry? So all of this information is being fed into the system and out come two scores. Both are between one and 10 and they quantify how likely somebody is to recidivate, to commit a crime should they be released. A score of 10 means that somebody is highly likely to recidivate. And the two scores are one is for general recidivism and the other is for dangerous recidivism, murder and rape and similar crimes. So judges take this information, these scores under advisement when they decide how to sentence individuals and whether to release them on bail pending trial. Um, so what these uh, journalists from ProPublica did was they uh, looked at data from a particular county in the US, Broward County, Florida. They looked at the inputs to the tool and at the scores that the tool produced. And then they also correlated this data with whether or not these individuals were rearrested three years down the road to check whether or not the predictions of the tool are meaningful. So rearrests were taken as a proxy for reoffense. It's not a perfect proxy, of course, but it's sort of the best we got given the data. And so what was found here was quite disturbing. The first thing they found was that the tool was very often inaccurate. Of course, there are many ways to measure accuracy, and we will talk about a few of these, but according to some particular measure, it's 61% accurate only. So just think about that number in the context of how, the, in the context of this domain, that it's so high stakes. It's someone's liberty that's really at stakes here. The second finding was that uh, the tool made mistakes in a way that correlates with race. If you are white, then it was far more likely that you would be deemed uh, less dangerous, yet go on to reoffend than for a black person. And the opposite was true for, so the false positives and false negative rates were essentially in the opposite order for the two subpopulations. We will look at this in detail um, in just a couple of slides. So what is in common between all of these examples uh, from discounts on staples, staplers to uh, employment to the criminal justice system. One way look, to look at this is to say that all these examples are telling us something about bias, in quotes, in predictive analytics. And so now we need to actually think about what it is that we mean by bias in this setup. So statistical bias in the model is Something that, of course, statisticians and machine learning researchers and practitioners, as well as you guys, have been thinking about for a very long time, right? And so what does statistical bias mean? It means, kind of very simply speaking, that a model does not fit the data well. For example, you're trying to come up with a linear boundary between your examples, but the space is not linearly separable. The actual boundary is rugged. This is not the kind of bias that we mean when we say that there is racial bias in criminal sentencing tools. Instead, what we're referring to is societal bias. And this is bias that is in the data for any number of reasons. 
So what could be some of these reasons? One of the reasons might be that the data set simply does not represent the world correctly that there is over-representation or under-representation of some particular part of the space in your data. And this is something that uh, my understanding is that you are struggling with in this community as well, right? That there is not enough representation from all different demographics in the data sets with which you work. Um, in the criminal justice system, where might this bias come in? It might be because we deploy very many police cars to particular neighborhoods and then this is where we make all of the arrests. And then this particular set of demographics is overrepresented in the data. So this is just to say that if we take the world as a given, a data set may be biased because it's a distorted picture of the world. But another representation of societal bias may be that even if we suppose that we can take a perfect image of the world such as it is, the world itself is incorrect. The world is not what it could or what it should be. And this whether or not the world is correct or incorrect is not something that an algorithm or a data set can know and can tell us, right? This is something that we as individuals and we as a society have to debate and attempt to come to a consensus on. And this is really very, very difficult. How should we change the world? Is it just or is it unjust? What are the kinds of interventions that we're comfortable with? So an important point here, of course, is that when you look at a data set, a data set is not going to know what it has and what it's missing. It's not going to know whether it's biased and for what particular reason. Is it a broken image of the world or is it a perfect image of the world that's broken? Um, and so there are many attempts uh, in academia as well as in industry to de-bias data sets and therefore to make algorithmic decision making based on these data sets fair according to some measure. But in a sense, if you keep this kind of this reasoning in mind that the data set doesn't know what it doesn't know, this is a hopeless pursuit, right? Or at least it's very, very limited in the, in the effectiveness that it can have. Fixing the data is not going to fix the world's problems, so to say. Um, and so, be it as it may, uh, when data is about people, bias can lead to discrimination. So in the US, uh, we have two doctrines. Uh, the doctrine of disparate treatment and the doctrine of disparate impact that aim at preventing or mitigating the effects of historical discrimination. These two doctrines are, have the same goal, but operationally they are in opposition with each other. So disparate treatment says that it is illegal to treat an entity based, an individual, based on a protected characteristic, such as race, gender, age, religion, sexual orientation, or national origin. Disparate impact is the result of systematic disparate treatment where disproportionate adverse impact is observed on members of a protected class as a group. So the first point talks about individuals, essentially, and using their membership in demographic groups. The second talks about population groups. Uh, and which of, this, of these is right is a big question, right? And actually, uh, neither one of them is right to the extreme, so to say. So here's an illustration of where these two notions and the these two doctrines and the corresponding notions of fairness that they give rise to are in opposition. So here I'm giving you an example of a population of 10 individuals. And I'm in a situation where I'm giving outcomes, assigning outcomes to these individuals. Individuals on your left uh, have a plus. They got the positive outcome. It's an outcome that they desire. This is a college admissions example in particular. And individuals on the right got the negative outcome. So this is a resource constrained environment. There are only so many pluses I can give. And in my example here, I can only give four out of 10. And so what I'm obser observing here is that while 40% of the population overall are receiving the positive outcome, only 20% of the blacks are receiving the positive outcome, yet 60% of the whites are. And so this just in itself, by looking at the parity of outcomes, tells us that there may be disparate treatment, disparate impact rather, observed on this population, on the black population. Now, if we have a limited number of pluses to give, then we have to take away a plus from an individual, from somebody, so I'm picking an individual on the bottom left, and to reassign it to somebody on the top right. And so this is now going to balance the outcomes between the demographic groups. 
And yet its effect is going to be that the individual who used to have a plus and now has a minus, and everybody around them has a plus, is going to be unhappy. So this essentially illustrates that there is a tension between group fairness and individual fairness, which we can see as interpretations of disparate treatment and disparate impact. And which one of these is right? Again, the, the jury is still out, quite literally. Uh, cases of this sort reach the Supreme Court with some regularity. So this was uh, a very famous case in 2009, where um, it was ruled uh, essentially in favor of upholding the disparate treatment doctrine. So there was a test that firefighters took in Connecticut. The test was for promotion. None of the black firefighters scored highly, and the department threw out the test results in favor of being sued for disparate impact, for group unfairness. But then the white firefighters sued, and they said, our race was used against us in this case. So this is actually disparate treatment. And this went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the composition of the Supreme Court usually can tell us how these cases will be decided. So here I'm underscoring that the majority opinion, that the white firefighters win, was by Kennedy, and the dissent was by Ginsburg. So the reason I'm bringing this up is that essentially what these arguments boil down to are some beliefs about the world rather than some logical arguments or you know, computational mechanisms or otherwise. Uh, I also want to bring up that there's an ongoing attempt at regulation in New York City in which I participate, uh, and I'm uh, more than happy to discuss how, how this is going. So we don't currently have any federal regulation in the US, unlike the GDPR in Europe, that tells us that we really need to pay very close attention to how data-driven algorithmic decision-making is uh, affecting individuals and population groups. So in New York, we were the first municipality to pass a law, this is Local Law 49 of 2018, that compels us to think very carefully about how data and algorithms are used to affect individuals in the public sector. So this is not to regulate the private sector, only New York City government. Um, so the original proposal uh, of this bill was by Council Member Vaca. It fits exactly on this slide. I'm a data person, so I'm highlighting the, the occurrence of the word data here four times. And what this proposal said was that whenever a New York City agency uses a program to make any decisions, we should make the code of that program publicly available online. What do you guys think about this? Good idea? It could be a good idea, right? But what if it's Microsoft Word? Uh, can they post the code online? So how do we actually figure out what, what that program is? So perhaps it's a good idea. Uh, I was actually uh, opposed to, to this bill in, 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 the, in this form because I think that that doesn't go far enough, that in addition to posting the code when that is possible, we also need to explain what that code does. We need to make access to the data available to individuals and to really explain how it computes rather than you know, what literally is the code of the program. Uh, so the law that was ultimately passed is actually quite different from the original proposal based on feedback from, from many uh, in the city. And it compels that an automated decision systems task force, ADS task force, be put in place. And I have the pleasure uh, of serving on that task force that is developing procedures to advise city agencies on how to respond to requests about whether or not uh, systems are biased and discriminatory or discriminatory, how to give uh, information to individuals about decisions that were made that affect them. So for example, if your child is given a spot in a particular school but not in another, you should have the right to ask for an explanation of why that decision was reached the way that it was reached. And finally, we want to make sure that agencies make, uh, give the public access in general to what are these automated decision systems that they use and how do they operate. So our report is going to be out in just a month and a half, I believe, of the task force, so please stay tuned. Um, so now I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, fairness in risk assessment. <clears throat> to continue on this example about the trade-off or the tension between individual fairness and group fairness that we already saw in classification. Um, so in New Jersey, uh, a comprehensive reform of the bail system was passed. 
And part of this reform was to uh, institute, to, to require judges to use a particular system, not COMPASS, another system, a system called PSA, to advise them on bail recommendations. Uh, and what I'm showing you is a quote from a manual that, that was uh, put together by the ACLU, the National Association for uh, Criminal Defense Lawyers, and the New Jersey Public Defender, so the, the good guys, so to say. Uh, and in this manual, there's a statement that is supposed to be helping uh, defenders really navigate this new system. And the statement is, switching from a system based solely on instinct and experience to one in which judges have access to scientific, objective risk assessment tools could further the criminal justice system, uh, system's central goal of increasing public safety, reducing crime, etc., etc. So what I'm questioning in this sense, sentence is that the tools that they're being handed to judges are in fact objective and scientific. So I already gave you a preview of, of this result uh, of the ProPublica investigation of racial bias in the use of COMPASS. So now, now what I would like to tell you is a bit more about this and more about what it tells us more generally about the use of risk assessment tools in the criminal justice system and elsewhere. So this is a breakdown of the false positive rates and the false negative rates that the COMPASS tool produces uh, by race. So in the first row, you see uh, the likelihood that somebody would be labeled high risk but not reoffend. So these are false positives. The rates are strikingly high. For the white defendants, this is 23.5%, and for the blacks, it's almost 45%. This is the likelihood that somebody who would not commit a crime should they be released is kept behind bars. And the second row tells us essentially the likelihood of false negatives. Individuals labeled low risk who, who went on to be rearrested. For the whites, this is very high, 47.7%. For African Americans, still high, but it's about half of that number, 28%. So this seems unfair to us, right, at every level. Even if you don't subscribe to affirmative action and similar mechanisms, just having such a gross imbalance in error rates speaks to us. There's something wrong here. So what is wrong and can it be avoided? So to set up this problem, let's talk more generally about risk assessment. A risk assessment tool gives a probability estimate of some future outcome. And because it gives an estimate, and predictions are very difficult, especially of the future, it will make mistakes. So what we care about when we talk about fairness in risk assessment tools is how these mistakes are distributed across subpopulations. Uh, and so there's this result that several groups of researchers came to at the same time because they used the insights and the data and the methodology that ProPublica provided in 2016. So this really spurred a lot of research uh, in this area. The result is as follows. So suppose that you have a tool that is calibrated. Your tool is not broken entirely. It actually is trying to predict something and its predictions are valid to some extent. And what we want in fact is for a tool to make predictions that make sense both across the board and in subpopulations. And so we can show that in fact in a certain band, COMPASS is well calibrated. In the window around 40%, the fraction of defendants who were rearrested is about 40%, both across the board and in subpopulations. So the tool works somewhat. Now, if we know that the tool works, that it's calibrated, and another way that we put it is that it satisfies predictive parity, yet the prevalence of the phenomenon it's trying to predict differs across subpopulations, meaning recidivism rates actually are different between the white and the black population in the US for whatever reason or reasons, then my tool cannot simultaneously equalize false positive rates and false negative rates. So just behold this result. We are using tools in a society that is, in my judgment, unfair because the phenomenon occurs at a different rate in subpopulations. If the tool is to be accurate, at least to some extent, it cannot be fair. You cannot make 
fair predictions in an unfair world. Yet these are tools that are being used in, in court today. And these results are not for Compass specifically, right? This is for any tool. So the tool, the PSA tool that we're using in New Jersey has the same issue. And as a matter of fact, the result is even more general. So if you just look at this very simple uh, two by two matrix that gives us numbers or, or rates rather of uh, true negatives, false positives, false negatives, and true positives. If you have an instrument that is calibrated, yet the incidence of the phenomenon you're trying to predict differs across subpopulations, you cannot simultaneously equalize any two measures that you derive from this matrix. So that's something close to 400 measures, 400 impossibility theorems, rather. Um, so an, um, another important point here is that, yes, this impossibility result is going to hold generally. And furthermore, which of these measures we prioritize depends on who we are, depends on the stakeholder, depends on our interests. For a decision maker like a judge, what they might want to know is of those I've labeled high risk, how many will recidivate? For a defendant, what's perhaps more important is how likely am I to be incorrectly classified high risk and kept behind bars? And these two points of view are, in a sense, irreconcilable. So these are the real trolley problems that fairness and also you know, other, other aspects of data-driven algorithmic decision-making present to us. To zoom out, there are many reasonable fairness and diversity notions that have been considered in philosophy and in law and in the social sciences, and now we are starting to understand also in computer science and in data science that these cannot simultaneously coexist. And this, this is news to us because we are used in computer science to a situation where there is a ground truth and we can build our machines to somehow achieve and predict that ground truth. And yet in this world, this is not the case. Uh, so there does not exist a single measure to rule them all, and we should be very careful to decouple our beliefs about what is or is not fair from mechanisms that are consistent with these beliefs. So uh, I think I have a few more minutes. Five? Yeah, okay. So let me just uh, give you a kind of a flavor of a few of the technical insights uh, that make not only my heart really be excited about working on these problems, but also my mind. Uh, there, there are very interesting algorithmic problems here that I think also have bearing on your domain. So one domain in which I've been working is set selection and ranking, and that has applications to employment, as well as, uh, I think, to selecting candidates for clin clinical trials as well as to college admissions and other domains. So suppose that you have a bunch of candidates coming in, in some score order, in ranked order, from better to worse, and you want to select four applicants among them. How might you go about that? You might decide to take the best four, or to take them in proportion, and so I have different colors here that designate membership and groups, or to take them in proportion to their representation in the input, or I may want to equalize the representation in the output, take two blue and two red. We are developing systems that allow data scientists to state their particular constraints, which of these cases they prefer explicitly, and to then enact these constraints in situations where there may be multiple memberships of, in protected groups, for example, by race and by gender, while at the same time, maximizing utility, maximizing the sums of scores. And I'm not going to go at, uh, into this uh, in detail. The one thing that I want to underscore is that it's very important when developing these mechanisms for set selection and for ranking, among other things, to think from, uh, from the start about membership in protected groups. So this is actually an example of where we want to incorporate fairness and diversity by design into our systems, rather than as an afterthought and as a post-processing step. Uh, we've also done a lot of work on fairness and stability in ranking otherwise. We've looked at some interesting trade-offs between parity and outcomes and balancing error in these scenarios, uh, where we show that in fact it is possible to select diverse groups of participants according to multiple demographic characteristics that people may satisfy simultaneously, while at the same time bounding the loss, essentially, in the solution that you, uh, that you derive. Um, an answer to the question of what's fair in my mind is therefore really not is there the right fairness measure, but rather how can we surface the trade-offs to the data scientist who is developing these processes 
as well as to a decision maker and to a member of the public. And this is really what requires transparency and accountability mechanisms. So this is a kind of a segue from thinking about fair and diverse outcomes to systems in which we can enact transparency in this reasoning. So here I would like to make a couple of points that are informed by my uh, regulatory engagement uh, for the most part, but that again I hope that will apply in this context as well. So the first one is that algorithmic transparency is not synonymous with releasing the source code. Publishing source code helps, but it is sometimes unnecessary and it is often insufficient. Because for us to understand what the system does, we really need to see how it works on data. Um, and so that takes me to my second point that says that algorithmic transparency really and truly requires data transparency. So what is data transparency? Is it actually publishing all the data online? That is also infeasible, and in this domain you know this very well, right? There are very, very strict constraints on this. So what can we do? In addition to making data public that we can make public, there is an opportunity for us to develop mechanisms to document the data collection and validation methodologies. And this is not something that is done, by the way, as a practice in domains like the criminal justice system or employment. Uh, and also, there is a chance for us to generate privacy-preserving synthetic summaries of the data. And this is something that my colleagues and I are working on very closely. Um, so releasing privacy-preserving uh, synthetic data can be done in any number of ways. For example, we can use differential privacy approaches. So there is a tool that we developed that helps you do that, that's used in, the, in, in a few public sector entities already. And uh, we're more than happy to, to discuss how it can be used in your domain. Uh, the tool is called the Data Synthesizer. It shows a kind of a before and after data distribution of the real data set that you own, and then a synthetic data set that you can release while provably protecting individuals who are members of that data set from re-identification. Uh, we're also taking this work further into generating semi-synthetic data sets that are not only privacy preserving, but also bias correcting and we have applied this to the transportation domain so far, but we see many other applications for this. Um, my fourth point, and that's perhaps the most important, is that transparency requires interpretability. We need to be able to explain to decision makers and to individuals being affected what the data contains and what the algorithm does. And so I'll, I'll stop here. This is a nutritional label that we have developed that explains the results of a set selection and ranking process. So, Thank you very much, uh, and let me just leave you with this last slide. Yeah. Th thank you very much. Um, you know, this is a room that has a lot of data people in it, and so I'm sure they saw lots of connectivity to what they do. You talked about accountability, transparency, uh, data regulation, risk assessment, uh, very much of it applies to the genomics and health data domain. So questions? So from the floor, and apparently there could be some up on the screen. Oops. Yes, of course. So I don't want this to sound like my feeling on transparency, but when you guys entertained the thought on transparency and making the algorithms available, was there discussion on essentially gaming the system so that they could make, individuals could inappropriately game it towards themselves? Yes, indeed. So uh, there are really uh, sort of several standard arguments, and they are reasonable arguments, uh, that are against transparency. One is privacy. The other is uh, competitive advantage, so intellectual property. And the third is gaming, right? And so my answer to this is that, yes, indeed, it is possible that some systems may be gamed. However, at the moment, we just have so very little information about what systems are out there that it's very difficult for us to even do research on this. So it essentially is used as a blanket excuse, uh, but in my opinion, really in high stakes domains especially, we should look very hard for excuses to be transparent rather than to withhold transparency. So this requires further study, but yeah, not everything game can be gamed, surely. So we have a question up. Are your slides available? Because um, David would like to, 
Oh, can you see that? Yes. There you go. Dig deeper on a few of the references. Yes, absolutely. So my website is data responsibly. Yes, anything that githubio.com uh, and there you can look at the talks link I will post these particular slides to to that link uh, but there are other slide decks there all the research is published there and there's also a course with all materials publicly available that you can access through that site uh, a course on responsible data science with Python code with slides with readings so please use all of this and give me feedback great other questions? You got the box? Okay. Uh, yes, first time I use this box. <laughs> uh, so, um, if you want to achieve fairness in, a, in selection of individuals, uh, you essentially need to have information about their belonging to specific groups such as gender and race. And that, by definition, is not allowed to have as the input information. So, how do you? suggest this can be achieved? So, so there are two ways to, to respond to this. One is that this is actually a case where we need to change regulation. Uh, the disparate treatment doctrine is really working against us here. Uh, and, and this is what many of us in the research community feel and many of us have demonstrated in work, is that you really need access to these attributes if it is your goal to meaningfully mitigate these group effects. Now, a kind of a roundabout answer is that although you cannot explicitly use, say, gender or race, it is extremely easy to recover them from data. There are very, very many proxies. Uh, and this, in fact, is what these machine learning methods are doing silently, right? I mean, why do they discriminate based on race if race is not even one of the inputs? So for the compass example, race was not one of the inputs, yet we see this, this effect. It's because the data speaks, right? So blinding ourselves to that attribute is really not very helpful. Yeah. Another question over there? Uh, I have a blue box and apparently it throws my voice. Thank you, you for a wonderful talk, uh, a, a real provocation uh, for us to think seriously about a number of things. And it, it, it strikes me, and it's something that we are beginning to think about in ga for gh that this is precisely the sort of area in which we need to think to transdisciplinarity and we need to think to uh, the involvement of those who are most affected by those data into the interpretation and the translation of some of these inbuilt biases that we don't even know are in there until we know they're in there. I wonder if maybe you could say something, and thinking about the practical ways in which this might occur, and if you have something to say on this. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, for, for a wonderful question. So I was actually in, uh, in the session before this that discussed patients' perspectives. And I see a lot of commonalities between these types of discussions and what I talked about here and, and your question as well, right? So the reason that I work in this area is because I, as a human being, feel very deeply about these issues. And we heard the presentation also from researchers who became involved in studying a particular disease because one of them uh, was found to be susceptible to, the, uh, susceptible to that disease. So indeed, we need to involve, involve affected communities. It's really very difficult because understanding and knowledge and trust lacks. And so even our judges who are using these tools to make decisions uh, are not well informed about what data science is or isn't. People just tend to think that algorithms are magic, frankly. And so we really need to work hard to dispel them of that notion through our public education efforts because there's going to be a knee-jerk reaction, and it's happening already, where we go from algorithms are awesome to ban algorithms. And this is really not where we want to be, right? We need to catch this moment to find a productive set of interventions where we can understand, with the public's help, where the use of these techniques is appropriate, what we should be checking for, what are some of the benefits, what are some of the harms, and where we should stop ourselves from using these things. But the moment is really now. Um, yeah. So Julia, you have some questions up there. We only have about two minutes left, but if you'd like to. Right, if you can't make algorithms fair, is it more fair to let humans decide or to use unfair algorithms? So, so I don't think that this is now a question about fairness. We can't really make algorithms fair because there is not one fairness notion. Uh, what algorithms help us with is they record their decisions, right? So for a judge, we really don't know kind of what goes into that decision. For an algorithm, we can know. But ultimately, this is down to who takes responsibility for a decision. And whoever takes that responsibility, whoever exercises agency, has to be a human entity. 
It has to be an individual, right? It cannot be an algorithm because we cannot blame an algorithm. If an algorithm makes a fatal mistake, how do we grieve, right? So, so th this is really the concern here. It's less fairness and it's more justice and agency and responsibility. Maybe one more. Should you tweak how the algorithm handles biased data or go get cleaner data? So I think you should do both. Uh, and this, in fact, is what kind of the, the opinion is that we're converging on as a community is that, of course, once one tool is not going to help us, one size does not fit all. So it takes all interventions together. Uh, absolutely, it's very important to get more data. If you realize that you just don't have enough representation of a particular demographic to make robust predictions, no amount of tweaking your algorithm will help, right? You need to go and get more data, even if that requires negotiating a data sharing agreement that is very, very difficult, right? But this is what we have to do. Um, it's important to also steer clear of just this techno-solutionism, right? Pretending that fixing algorithms, fixing data will really fix society's problems. It, it won't fully. Uh, maybe I can end with that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you all very much, and thank you, Julia. That was a very interesting talk, I think, uh, something that we haven't uh, really been exposed to in this way before. So thank you. Thanks.